بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه وسن بسنته إلى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so who will read the first uh, hadith for us inshallah moderator yes, ah bismillah uh, al ma'rur bin suwaid said i saw abu dhar wearing a robe and his slave likewise they asked him about that and he said i insulted a man and he complained about me to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who asked me did you insult him by his mother i replied yes he said your brothers are your charges Allah has put them under your authority. If someone has his brother under his authority, he should feed him from what he eats and clothe him from what he wears and not burden him with anything that would be too much for him. And if, if you burden him with what may be too much for him, then help him. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. This hadith has been reported in the Sahih. So now, is Al-Adab Al-Mufrad part of the Sahih? Yes or no? No, it's a separate book. Sahih Al-Bukhari has many chapters in it. One of them, them chapters is called Al-Adab. But this one is a separate book called Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, which means that the condition of authenticity is not similar to Sahih Al-Bukhari. It is much lenient. Nevertheless, it contains a lot of the hadiths found in Al-Bukhari itself. Abu Dhar Al-Ghafari, the one in this story, is... So Abu Dhar Al-Ghafari was one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, he says that I was one of five only in Islam. What does that mean? He was very early. Nevertheless, this statement is not uh, entirely correct. Why? Because in the beginning of Islam, we had three years of secret da'wah, which meant that a lot of the Muslims did not know the others. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the ten heaven bound, used to say, I was one of three in Islam. But there was Khadija, there was Ali, there was Abu Bakr, there was Zayd ibn Haritha. They did not know of each other because it was secret. But nevertheless, when he says, Abu Dhar, I was five of Islam, meaning that he was among the very earliest to accept Islam. And he was not only a companion, he was a scholar. To the extent that he used to give fatwa at the time, of Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, which means that he was knowledgeable. There are companions that are good companions, but they don't have the knowledge to give fatwa. Abu Dhar was one among of those. And this would pave the way for you to see how the Prophet ﷺ treated him. Now, Al Ma'rur ibn Suwayyid, he saw. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari with a slave of his and each one was wearing half a garment what, what does that mean and one was covering his top and the other one was covering his bottom no definitely not in the past the Arabs used to wear a suit like garment so they you know when you go for a haram you have the waist wrapper and you have something to cover your uh, upper body this is known as hulla it's a suit like. So Al Ma'rur saw Abu Dhar with this half suit on him, and the other half is on his slave servant. So he said, Abu Dhar, if one of you wore it, it would have been more appropriate. It would look like you know a full suit instead of sharing it with someone and you're walking with this half and he's walking with that half. So Abu Dhar explained 
And his explanation came to us from another narration. What's the story? There was a dispute, he said, between me and one of the companions. And in another hadith, we were told that this companion was Bilal ibn Rabah, the black Abyssinian slave who was among the first to accept Islam at the time of Mecca, who was tortured in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. Abu Dhar was a great companion. Bilal was a great companion, yet they had differences. So he said, once I disputed with him, we were in an, a heated argument. And at the moment, I was not thinking straight. So I slandered him with his mother. What did he say? He said, you are the son of a black woman. Footnote, what was the color of Bilal's mother? She was black. So what's the problem? Did he lie? He was the son of a black woman. He didn't lie, but what was his intention when he said it? Now, what did Bilal do? Nothing. Bilal went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained. So the Prophet ﷺ summoned Abu Dhar. Come, I'd like to see you. Abu Dhar comes. Did you slander him with his mother? Did you say that you are the mother, the son of a black woman? Abu Dhar said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. What did the Prophet respond ﷺ? He said, you are a man with some ignorance in you. Abu Dhar was quite old in his age not only that he's knowledgeable he's among the first to accept islam to leave kufr which is known in arabic what jahiliya ignorance is jahl so when the prophet accuses him by saying you are a man with some ignorance with some jahiliya in you he said to him "O prophet of allah after this age you are accusing me of this and telling me of this after this age, the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, yes. And then he said this hadith. Now, the hadith is crystal clear. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, your brothers are your charges. They are your responsibility. The Arabic word for uh, uh, used in here is khawalukum. And khawalukum means your slaves. Now the issue is, Bilal was not a slave anymore. Bilal was a free man. So when the Prophet ﷺ is telling Abu Dhar, your servant, your slave is under your charge. You have to feed him from what you eat. You have to clothe him from what you wear. You have to not assign things that are difficult and beyond his ability. This is for a slave. What is a slave? A slave that you buy and sell. What about Bilal? Bilal is a free man. So it should have been known to you that this is known as Bab Awla. What is the meaning of Bab Awla? In Islamic terminology, sometimes Allah tells us in the Quran about something and this is the bare minimum. And whatever is above it is by default. So when Allah says to us, do not say to any of your parents, uff. What is uff? It's a gesture that you say. It shows your discontent. So if someone says, I will never say to my mother uff. But if she tells me to do something, I will push her. <laughs> and maybe beat her. What are you doing? He said, Allah did not say, do not beat your parents. Did he? Nowhere in Islam, in Quran, in Sunnah. I follow Quran and Sunnah. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, you follow your shaitan. <laughs> he said, show me in the Quran where Allah says, do not beat your parents. Or in the Sunnah. Akhi, are you crazy? The Prophet, this is known in fiqh, but those terrorists, those who only fo follow their whims and desires don't understand Quran and Sunnah. This is why it's very dangerous. 
if you don't have the knowledge, the proper knowledge, studying it with shuyukh, and understanding, not blind following, you have to understand, Islam is a religion of nature. It's logical, but you have to open your mind to understand it. The Prophet says, do not urinate in stagnant water, then perform wudu. Correct? Basic fiqh hadith. So one says, hmm, do not urinate. Hmm. Okay, I will do it in a bowl, in a bottle, and then pour the bottle in the water. I did not urinate in it. So I can do now wudu. Okay, where did you get this understanding? So the hadith is clear. Do not urinate. I did not urinate in the water. I just spilled urine in it. Someone else says, okay, I will not urinate, but I'll defecate. The Prophet did not say, do not defecate. He said, only urinate. This is bab awla, the minimum. And whatever is above it, it's crystal clear. And likewise here, the Prophet is saying, if these free servants of yours, you have to feed them, you have to, if he is indicating this while addressing the issue of Bilal, it shows you how Islam orders us to treat the slaves. The Prophet is saying this hadith towards a free man who is Bilal. Then how should I treat someone who is under my control and under my uh, uh, servant? I don't know if we need to go to this. And I don't remember if I tackled this issue last year. I don't think you even remember it. But <laughs> nowadays, Muslims are intimidated. Whenever you speak, they hold things against you. So if I were from the media and I would like to hold something against me, I would say, oh, he is promoting slavery. His first hadith is talking about slavery. And this is against the Geneva Convention. And this is against human rights. And this is against animal rights. And they make an issue out of it. First of all, do not be intimidated. Are you proud of your religion? Yes. Understand your religion and know that your religion is not tailored, made for a region or a country or a tribe or a race. This is a religion for the entire universe and not for a specific time. It's for all times until the day of judgment. So, Sheikh, you, do you mean to tell me that slavery is applicable today? It's applicable until the day of judgment. But what slavery are we talking about? And I don't want to go out of the topic, but unfortunately, it is essential that you understand so that when someone comes to you and says, your religion has this and this and this and this, you don't concave on yourself and start thinking, should I put a rope and hang myself or not? No, be proud of your religion. Slavery is the answer for a global problem. We have nowadays wars happening, either just or unjust. No one who claims to have human rights ever commented on the wars done by the kuffar. So Hiroshima, Nagasaki, halal or haram? This is uh, human rights? Don't bring this up. World War I, World War II, don't bring this up. Afghanistan, Iraq, the bombardment of these countries, the killing of the millions worldwide, don't bring this up. What's happening to the brothers in Rohingya, in Raqqa, Arakan? Don't bring this up. We have wars ongoing. Some are just, some are unjust. Islam deals with the prisoner of wars issue in the best of humane ways by enslaving them. Oh, Sheikh, enslavement, haram, human rights. Wait, 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 hold your horses. Tie them outside and there is a parking area. You can have enough place for the horses. Hold your horses because first of all, do we have problem of prisoners of war? Yes. So how does Islam solve this? Because 
the issue of war is inevitable. We, at the moment, the Muslims have no wars. They're just defending themselves. But what happens if there were a Muslim war, uh, or if there are prisoners that are non-Muslims, kill them all. This is one option. Mentioned in Surah Muhammad. Or ask for ransom, option two. Or set them free. They will become recruited again and they will attack us. But it's an option. For enslavement, they become slaves. Nowadays, compare slavery in Islam to any other slavery. I go to XYZ country in Asia. They're so poor, devastated. He says, come, buy my son for $100. He's yours, he's a slave. Buy my daughter for $200, she's your slave. Some tribes, like in Africa before, they used to come and arrest people who were free and ship them to America and to Europe. Why? Because they're free. We can do this. So slavery in other nations has a lot of venues and channels. In Islam, how many channels do we have? Only one. And this is when the Muslims fight in a just and fair war against the non-Muslims. Okay, then Islam encourages slavery. No, it doesn't. How do you mean? We have so many slaves. Akhi, look at the chapter of expiations in Islam. Sheikh, I swore by Allah tomorrow I will not have dinner with my friend. But now he's serving a very nice biryani. What should I do? Expiate for your oath. How? Free a slave. Oh, first thing. Free a slave. One says, oh, Sheikh, I made something wrong. I had intimacy with my wife during the daytime of Ramadan, and I broke my fast. Free a slave. Sheikh, I said to my wife, you are haram for me. I didn't divorce her. This is called vihar. You are like my mother or like my sister. I will never have intimacy with you. Now I am regretful. Free a slave. Sheikh, I was driving down the highway, and I overslept and the car rolled and I killed someone by mistake. This is not manslaughter, it's my mistake. Free a slave, and so on. So the chapter of expiations all encourages you to do what? To free slaves. Not only that, why are you a Muslim? Because I want to go to Jannah and escape hellfire. No problem, free a slave. Huh. The Prophet says, Islam, whoever frees a slave, Allah will free with each organ of the slave an organ of his from hellfire. So when you free a slave next time, make sure he has two arms and two legs. <laughs> Be careful. And if you free two female slaves, Allah will free you from hellfire. What kind of a religion is this? It's a religion of global thinking, of peace. So it doesn't only tell you to have slaves, it tells you how to free them. And the channels of freeing them are far greater than the channels of keeping and having them. So this hadith shows you the status of slaves in Islam. I'm the master. I'm the owner. I can sell and buy like my horse outside in the parking. A slave is like my horse. I can sell him and buy him. I go to the market every Friday and I see the slaves and I buy whatever I want. Yet, look what Islam tells you how to deal with them. You clothe them from what you wear. Abu Dhar did that. You feed them from what you eat. My same food. I'm going to, uh, uh, I don't give brand names of restaurants. XYZ restaurant. And he eats with me. And if I appoint a task for this slave, you have to do this and this and this, and it's too difficult for him, the Prophet says, Give him a helping hand. I don't give a helping hand to my servant or to my driver or to my co-worker. Islam tells you, no, you should. If this is your slave, this is a free man that you have to do this. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Moving on to the second hadith. Ibn Umar said, 
I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, All of you are shepherds and each of you is responsible for his flock. The Imam is a shepherd and his, he is responsible for his flock. A man is the guardian of his family. A woman is a shepherd of her husband's house and she is responsible. As is the servant in regard to his master's property, I heard those words from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I reckon that the Prophet ﷺ also said, and the man is responsible regarding the property of his father. Sorry. Okay, this hadith is scary because it addresses the question of accountability. Now we live free, trouble free. We have no problem. The Prophet says here, no. Each one of us has a big problem. The biggest problem of all is the problem of the Muslim ruler or anyone who has subordinates under him. He is accountable to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ gave the similitude of a shepherd. A shepherd has sheep. So I'm responsible for my sheep. The first one responsible for all of us is the Muslim ruler. And this is why it is something entrusted to you. You remember Abu Dhar? Abu Dhar in an authentic hadith went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O oh Prophet of Allah, appoint me as a ruler over any district. Because the Prophet, there are districts in Islam, Mecca, Medina, Jeddah, Taif, etc. So he said, make me your ruler. Now, Abu Dhar is knowledgeable, Abu Dhar is capable, maybe, Abu Dhar is trustworthy, definitely. What did the Prophet say, He held him from his shoulders, shook him up, and said, Abu Dhar, it is a trust. And on the day of judgment, it is disgrace and shame, meaning upon those who do not fulfill the requirements. And you are weak. Meaning, it's not good for you. So he did not appoint any job. Nowadays, everything works here with what we call wasita. You know what is wasita? We, in Arab, the world, we call it vitamin wow. It is not what you know. It is who you know. So I get appointed in the company, in the government, in any place, the head, because of who I know. Regardless if I can fulfill or not. And this is why the Muslim world is going downhill. Because you have the people who are steering the ship, cannot even swim. So this hadith shows the gravity and seriousness of sin upon those who control who rule, who legislate other than with the Sharia. Ah. This is what they are going to be held accountable for. One, a person is responsible for those who are under him. So if I have no government position, I do not manage a company. All what I have is my wife and children. Allah will hold me accountable for whatever I did not do well with them. Is my wife abiding by hijab? Are my children praying on time? Have I facilitated for them haram things to see in their homes? Have I facilitated for them to go abroad and do sinful acts and turning a blind eye saying that they're grown-ups, they're adults, if they go and gamble, if they fornicate, if they drink, this is their problem. Allah will hold me accountable. And the more you go up, the more accountability you have. So imagine the head of the state, the head of the country, how much burden he will come on the day of judgment. The old rulers felt this. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, had sleepless nights, and he's the second top man in the Muslim ummah. The Prophet is not included. Abu Bakr then, Umar. Umar used to say, 
by Allah. He was in Medina. If a mule were to trip in Iraq, I, I am afraid that Allah will ask me about it. <laughs> May Allah have mercy upon you, Umar. In Iraq, we have not mules, humans falling in ditches, dying out of poverty, out of illness, out of ignorance worldwide. And the Muslims are unaware of it. So this hadith is scary. It frightens you, especially if you are in a position to govern or to rule or to manage others. And this hadith also tells us that the responsibility is not upon the rulers themselves. It's also upon whomever governs something. So even a woman is accountable in her house. How? Sheikh, she cooks, cleans, irons, and that's it. No, she's entrusted with the food in her house. So even if she goes and takes from the pocket of her husband and gives to the poor without his permission, she's accountable. If she sends food to her family without his permission, she's accountable. If she's keen and careful to take care of his children and of his wealth and of his well-being, she's rewarded. So it is something of great seriousness. And also the servant is responsible for what he is being entrusted with, being it financial, being it tasks he's appointed to do with. And this accountability is illustrated in the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He tells us that your feet, the feet of the son of Adam, will not move on the day of judgment until he's asked about five things. So each and every one of you make sure that you will be questioned about these five questions. Number one, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, your age, where did you spend it in? So you are 60 years of age, 70, 80. Where was it spent? All in prayer? Definitely not. All in sin? Definitely, hopefully not. So you will be asked. So prepare an answer. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, your youth, and this is specific. And why is it specific? Because age includes your infancy, your youth, and your old age. But specifically, you will be asked about your youth, which is the longest period of your life. When you're young and small, this passes like a flashlight. It's so short. Once you are young and youthful, this lasts for 40 years, 50 years. You think it will never come to an end. And that is why people are deceived by their youth. They think they will stay young forever. And the older they get, they say we're like wine. The older it gets, the more vintage and better. We don't believe in wine, so let's skip this. Edit it, huh? Anyhow. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, wine in, in Islam is not always intoxicating. There is wine, which is the juice itself. It's called nabith. This is an issue, uh, another issue. The third thing, Allah will question you about your earning. Where did you earn it from? Halal sources? Did you earn it from riba? From selling something haram? From cheating? From stealing? From lying? This income, Allah will ask you about. Not only that, number four, he will ask you about where you had spent it. So you may have earned it from halal, but did you spend it in halal? A lot of the Muslims don't care where they spend it as long as they have it. They may be among those who commit israf and they may be among those who commit tabdhir. And we will come inshallah to discuss the difference between israf and tabdhir in uh, Islam. And finally, Allah will ask you about number five, which is your knowledge. Today's knowledge. What have you done? about it. 
Have you implemented it or you're just like a hard drive, saved it and moved to another application? This is something that you have to be aware that none of us will move his feet from in front of Allah until he's asked about these five things. Do we have someone to read the third hadith? Okay, now this hadith is crystal clear. Correct? We don't have to explain it. Alas, we can finish the whole course in half an hour like this. Do you need explanation for this? Let us see. Now, this hadith illustrates the beauty of the ayah mentioned in Surah Ar-Rahman. Allah Azza wa Jal says, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Allah says, is the reward of good anything but good? So, let us recap. What does the hadith talk about? The hadith talks about if someone does you a favor. Whoever is done a favor should repay it. So you do me a favor. What is your favor? You brought me a coffee that is cold. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's an example. Don't take everything literal what I say. It is gold. So he brought me a coffee. What should I say? Now I have to repay him. Type Repayment has a number of ways. One, to do something in return. Someone gives me a pen as a gift. So many times Muslims reject gifts. And this is against the Sunnah. Why? He said, Sheikh, he gave me a gift and I know he's poor. So I feel sorry for him. I don't want to accept his gift. This is prohibited in Islam. But he's poor. No problem. Accept the gift and give him something better. Pay him for it. Do something at least to mend and fix his heart. But if I'm poor and I give you something and you reject it, you broke my heart twice. By rejecting it and by not repaying me for it. Look at how Islam tells you to care for people's Feelings. Feelings is something we Muslims fail to care about. Is it halal or haram? Khalas. It's not haram, I'm not doing it. No, this is not the way we deal in Islam. The Prophet والسلام, did exactly the same. A man gave him an imbanjaniya, a dress that had thick, or uh, sorry, he gave him a khamisa. And this khamisa had drawings in it. The Prophet prayed in it. And while prayer, he was distracted by the drawings. Not haram drawings, but too many decorations and colorful things. So the Prophet said, والسلام, this khamisa has distracted me in my prayer. Send it back to Abu Jahm, the man who, who gave it to him. Send it back and bring me another garment from him. Why? So that his heart would not be broken. I return your gift, but I exchange it for something that would not distract me. How would Abu Jahim feel? Good. Because I am the one who gave it to the Prophet. ﷺ. So this hadith highlights how to cater for Muslims' feelings. When anyone does you a favor, do not think of your rights over him because this is what we usually do if Rizwan comes and does me a favor for example he um, brings me hot coffee I would not say this is his job no I have to repay him I have to thank him so how do I repay him either bring him a latte instead of my coffee or if I cannot Find the means to do so, then I should praise him. How would I praise him? When I speak to the brothers, I say, Wallah, brother Rizwan did this and did that. MashaAllah, he's helpful. He goes out of his way to heat up my coffee, even if it's cold. And he does. Th I keep on, you know, praising him until he's satisfied. Because I cannot uh, uh, praise him financially. 
why the Prophet says, when he praises him, he thanks him. He's fulfilled by my praising. Maybe it's much more than what he was expecting. If I do not praise him, nor repay him, most likely that being silent is a sign of being ungrateful. So many times, Muslims are like this. Not with the strangers, but with the closest people to your heart. When was the last time you thanked your spouse? Those who are married. Those who are married, raise your hands, please, among the men. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, and the majority are not. <laughs> when was the last time you thanked your wife for a good meal? When was the last time you praised your wife in front of your mother and father, saying, MashaAllah, my love did this and that, my wife uh, managed to do this and that, and you praise her. We as men are professionals in complaining. We go to our mother, oh mom, she didn't cook the food, she burnt it, she, I will never find a t-shirt that is ironed, the house is always messy, and, but alhamdulillah. What my mother approach when she meets my wife, she's angry, and you're causing hatred. Never mention anything negative about your wife to your mom. And never mention anything negative about your husband to your mother. She will never forget. A lot of the sisters, spouses have problems. Inevitably, you will meet your mom someday and you're not that on good terms with your spouse. So you will complain. After 10 minutes, you will kiss and make up with your, wife, with your spouse. Nothing happened. But the scar in your mother's heart will remain till the day of judgment. Be careful. Never involve your parents until it's the last resort. Therefore, check yourself. When was it the last time you praised your loved ones? In the break, inshallah, half an hour. Take your phone, turn it on, send an SMS of love and compassion to your spouse. And those who are not married, eat your hearts out. <laughs> it is your problem. You're not married. Do something about it. I'll give you my number. You can send me that SMS. I will delete it, inshallah. Therefore, it is essential that we praise people. Anyone, your, your, your servant, your uh, janitor. A Muslim is always down to earth. If someone is cleaning my car, I praise him. Though I'm paying him money, but I'm always sweet talking to people. This is a real Muslim. Not thinking high of themselves. No, even the janitor, even your gardener, even your subordinate, no matter what they do, always praise them. Because praising gets you more and more. When you criticize, when you don't think you're ungrateful, and this is what... Oops. Anyhow, this is what they will think of you and hence they will not ever do a good thing to you again. Then we come to uh, So what kind of praising can I do? Mentioning him a good name. He did so and so. If I don't have any person to mention him to, what should I do in another hadith? The Prophet said, make dua. And dua is something that Muslims have to always do to others. And we will come to mention this later on, inshallah. Imam Ahmad used to say to uh, uh, a Shafi's uh, uh, son, I think, he used to say, your father is among 30 whom I make dua for every single night. Now, you as Muslims, how many do you make dua for among your Muslim brothers or sisters every single night? Problematic. Because if you don't make dua for your brothers, 
and sisters, specifically my name. I personally make dua approximately for 25 people every single night. Since the past, Allah knows how long. I always remember them in dua. And there are a segment for the dead that who يعني, affected my life positively. I ask Allah every single night for them, for uh, uh, maghfirah, for expansion of their graves, etc. You look into your contact list and see how many do you make dua every single night for. If you don't, then you have issues that you have to address. Then we come to the last paragraph, which seems unrelated, is it? The Prophet says, if someone adorns himself with something he has not been given, it is as if he were wearing false garments. There is a mistake in the translation. I forgot to bring this up. The English text has a lot of, not a lot of, that is an exaggeration. It has a fair amount of mistakes. So, inshallah, I'll try my level best to point it out. Uh, I need to open it though, to remember it. Here, the Arabic hadith says, as if he's wearing two false garments. So it's not one, it's two false garments. And what does that mean? It means that whoever... Now, the Prophet والسلام, is telling us that if you praise someone truly for what he had done to you, you're grateful. Now, the other flip, the other side of the coin is that there are people who would claim favors from others that they did not do to them. Why? I'll tell you why. If I say, Brother Mukhairi, may Allah be pleased with him and may Allah have mercy on him, did me this and this and this and this, so I can gain status. If I pretend something that did not happen, this is as if I am wearing two false garments. What is the origin of this hadith? The origin of this hadith is a woman came to the Prophet and said, O Prophet of Allah, I am married to a married man, meaning that I have a co-wife. He's married to two women. Sometimes I meet my co-wife and I'd like to brag about things that are not real. Women are like this. They are the majority in this room, so if I am leaving, I need escort. <laughs> Women are like this. They like to pretend. Nowadays, in the era of Snapchat, men are like this as well. They like to claim things that they don't have. So this woman says, Oh, Prophet of Allah, when I meet my co-wife, I say, my husband, my hubby, did this and that, and he gave me this and that, and I'm lying. So is this permissible? The Prophet said, والسلام, whoever claims to have what he does not have is like one who wears two false garments, meaning that he does not, be, these garments do not belong to him. Why did the Prophet والسلام, mention two false garments? The reason is that usually, when you are called to testify in a court of law, if you go like this, maybe the judge would doubt you, especially if you're lying. But if you wear two garments of high value, the judge would look at you and probably say, this man is rich, this man is of high uh, uh, position, he cannot lie. So he accepts your testimony. So whoever claims something that he does not have, whoever pretends of something that has no reality, is actually as if he's wearing two garments of falsehood. Some other interpreters said that it's like wearing two sleeves. So if I wear a sleeve under this sleeve, you will think that I'm wearing two garments, where I'm actually wearing one, so I'm pretending to be something that I am not. And this hadith or this extension, wearing two false garments, is in all of us. 
Whenever we sit in a gathering, I'd like to brag about knowing this billionaire and this government official and this influential person and this scholar. I'd like to brag about knowing Sheikh so-and-so and, so, and, and we had dinner with Sheikh so-and-so. And part of these false garments is when I wear something that does not belong to me to pretend a certain social status. So you know this black uh, um, dress that the Arabs wear, you know, with the golden straps in it? We call it mishlah. So imagine if I come here wearing it, wearing the Saudi thobe and pretending to be among the Supreme High Council of Scholars. When you see me, you will think that, whoa, this guy is, mashallah, look at what he's wearing. This is false garments because I do not wear them in my country, except in Eid. Not even for Friday, I do not wear it. Though I have it. Being a Saudi, I can wear it. But I do not like to pretend something which I'm not. Why would I do that thing? I don't need this. And likewise, those who wear fake labels, brand names, Whoa, I apologize. I did not mean to offend you. Seriously, I could not understand why a Muslim would wear a fake Rolex. And he is driving a, a Prius. A Prius, I think, is expensive. What's, what's Kia, maybe, or Hyundai, or Chinese brand? He's wearing a fake Rolex that cost maybe 150 ringgits. Originally, it cost like 150,000. But he flashes it and, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. <laughs> Akhi, you know it's fake, I know it's fake. Why are you doing this? This, is, this hadith fits him correctly. He is wearing false garments, going and buying brands that are not original. Akhi, you don't have it? You don't need it. If you, ha if you can afford the money to buy it, buy only originals. Don't deceive the people because before you deceive them, you're cheap. You're deceiving yourself in the beginning. So if you have anything false, you'll find the box outside, inshallah. <laughs> you can put it, inshallah, may Allah reward you for that. Okay. I think it's... Understood, inshallah. We move on to number four. And with this paste, I think we need two more weekends, <laughs> inshallah. But we will try to finish it up. Abu Mas'ud al Ansari anhu, said, A man came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, My camel has become exhausted, so give me a mount. He said, I have none. But go to so and so, and perhaps he will give you one. He went to that man who gave him a mount. Then the man went back to the Prophet وسلم, and told him of this. He said, whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. Okay, the hadith is a beautiful reminder. What beautiful, Sheikh? We don't see anything except camels and mounts and what... A man came to the Prophet والسلام, where the Prophet was treating one of his camels with tar. You know, there is a skin disease well known in camels and this can only be solved by painting that disease with tar. So he came to the Prophet and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I want to go for jihad, but I don't have a right. So give me some of the camels from sadaqah, from charity. The Prophet apologized and said, I don't have any. I ran out of resources, but go to so-and-so. He's rich, he's capable, and inshallah he will help you. So the man went, and surely enough, the man was generous, and he gave him a right. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, when the man came back and told him that he was given, he said, whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. What does this mean? 
it means that Allah is the most generous. Even if you don't have the ability to spend, Allah will find ways for you to get the reward. How? By indicating means of goodness to others. So I'm poor, alhamdulillah, in Saudi standards, but your standards are, alhamdulillah, well off. <laughs> Till now. I am poor. I cannot give money in charity. But I have a lot of things to get means of charity through. So, by guiding others to means of righteousness, this is a door of charity. By teaching you, this is a door of charity. Also, if you put this in mind, by educating anyone around you, about a sunnah that was forgotten, about something that he does not know, about something that he forgot. For example, a lot of you hold bottles of water. Who has bottles of water with him? Mashallah, almost all. A lot of you drink with his left hand. And we will come to this inshallah. No, no, with his left. No, 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 with his left. I said a lot, not all. So a lot of you drink with his left hand. If I say, Akhi, this is haram, try your level best to drink with your right. I have means of charity. If you comply, then I'll have the same reward as you have done. If someone comes and says, I have extra money, I don't know what to do with it. And I tell you, I know a brother who cannot pay his electricity bill. And in two days, they will cut the power off. And you go, go and give him. He will have charity of 150 ringgit, I will have the same charity without paying a single penny. And this is why if you educate the ignorant, if you help the one who's in need of help, if you guide someone to someone who's willing to give and pay and support, then you have the same reward. And a lot of the smart people around us and among us know this so they cannot financially support others but they know someone who can so giving da'wah through facebook through twitter through all these social media to guide people to do something good you have the same reward by just a click of a keyboard button but also you have the same sin as guiding people to sins with the click of your keyboard button. And this is why people have to be aware of the goodness they can give. Don't hold back. When you have informative knowledge you can share with others, don't hold back. When you have financial resources, you can tell someone is in need of medication and you know some hospital that is giving it for free. Don't hold back. Always keep in mind I want reward. If you know of a good lecture, of a good teacher, don't hold back. Call your friends and tell them there is a lecture of so-and-so so that they can gain a lot of reward while you are sitting home enjoying your biryani. <laughs> the following hadith. Abu Huraira anhu said, the Prophet وسلم, went out to a group of his companions who were talking and laughing, and he said, by him who holds my soul in his hand, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh little and weep much. He left them then, and the group were in tears. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mighty and exalted, revealed to him, Muhammad, why did you make my slaves despair? The Prophet وسلم, went back and told them, receive the good news, follow the right path, and try to reach to that if you can exactly attain that and choose the middle way between going to excess and falling to show. The hadith, probably most of you have not heard. Probably most of you heard the first half and in a separate occasion, the second half. But the combination of two, no. Most likely, none of you have heard this. Let's go back. 
The Prophet ﷺ went to his companions. They were having a good time, laughing and enjoying. And the Prophet ﷺ warned them from this. And he said, if you know what I know in the present tense, I think here it's in the, in, in, in the past tense. It should be in the present tense. And there are different of things uh, that ne needs to be changed in the translation as well. The Prophet said, if you know what I know, you would laugh little and you will cry more. Now, we have to understand why the Prophet ﷺ said what he had said. A human being has two types of feelings overwhelming him. Fear and hope. And this is what the scholars of Tezkiyah say. That a human being has to have three types of feelings in him. Love, fear, and hope. So it's like a bird. The head of the bird is love of Allah. The wings of the bird are hope and fear. If you don't have the head, the, de the, the bird is dead. Anyone who does not have the love of Allah in his heart, he's not a Muslim. True? Who doesn't love Allah? Raise your hand. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Alhamdulillah, we're all loving Allah Azza wa Jal. Because if you raise your hand, you'd have found someone sniping you. <laughs> I met a Saudi brother. He's in his 60s. And he prays in the masjid. He fasts Ramadan. He gives zakat. I was talking to him about Allah's love. He said, listen, with all due respect, I pray fast. I fear Allah. I don't want to go to hell, but I don't love him. I said, you're crazy. Seriously. You talk without thinking. A lot of us do this. We don't think and contemplate. Akhi, if I were to give you this coffee, which is cold, <laughs> would you appreciate it? Yes. It, at least you can use the mug. But you'd appreciate it. Allah has given you what? Everything you possess and own. You have two feet to walk. You, every breath you take, Allah has favors upon you. Your heart beats, Allah has favors upon you. Your spouse, your children, your salary, your health, your wealth. And you're not loving Allah? People talk without thinking. Everyone loves Allah. But we fail to sit back and reflect on Allah's favors upon us. If you have the ability to walk, look at those who don't. If you have a car, look at those who are driving motorcycles. So Allah has so much upon us that you must love him. Now when we come to the wings, the majority of people usually fly tilted because they rely a lot on the hope rather on the fear. And that is why when I'm invited to haram, what do I think first of? Allah's forgiveness or Allah's punishment? I always think of Allah's forgiveness. So let me do something haram and Allah will forgive. And another haram and Allah will forgive. I rarely think of fear of Allah. That is why when the Prophet came to his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, the Prophet ﷺ was afraid that they will be tempted to fall into haram. That is why he warned them and he said to them, where? By him who holds my soul in his hand, if you knew what I knew, if you were to know what I know, you would laugh little and weep and cry more. Now look at the, reflect, the, the, the reaction of the companions. Did they Google it and said, hmm, no, we should trust Allah's mercy and this and this and that? Immediately they started to cry because they felt the gravity of what they were doing and they believed the Prophet ﷺ in his serious warning to them. However, the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he speaks, he speaks out of the divine 
inspiration and revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. And there are times that he speaks out of his own ishtihad. 99.9% .9 it's correct and according to what Allah has inspired him and this is why it is approved. But whenever he does something that needs correction, Allah corrects it. That's why in Surah Abasa, when a blind man comes to him and the Prophet frowns in his face, Allah doesn't let that pass. He stops Prophet Muhammad and tells him, Abasa wa tawalla. You frowned in his face and you turn your back to him. Did the Prophet sin? The, the man was blind. So even if the Prophet smiled in his face, he would not see it. Yet, Allah Azza wa Jal is up bringing and raising the level to the utmost of human perfection of our Prophet. Even the frown in the face of a blind man does not befit you, Muhammad. So even that, you should be. You should eliminate it. So Allah corrects his messenger whenever he does something that is not appropriate for him as a messenger of Allah Azza wa So the Prophet والسلام, was told by Allah, Muhammad, why did you make my slaves despair? That's it. So the Prophet realized that with the magnitude of Iman in his companions' hearts, he should go and fix that. So he went back to them. He did not feel any sort of arrogance that I'm the prophet. I said something. How can I retreat from saying it? No. He's not like us. He corrects it for the sake of Allah. So he goes for them and said, receive the good news. Abshiru. You will get the glad tidings. I'm giving you the glad tidings. Abshiru. And the Prophet also says to them, follow the right path, saddidu, meaning try your level best to follow the correct path and choose the middle way between going to excess and falling too short. So the Prophet is telling them that laughing is not a big problem, but don't exaggerate, don't fall into the wrong concepts that laughing may lead you to. So, in short, what is the ruling on laughing in Islam? I have five minutes. Is it permissible to laugh in Islam? Alhamdulillah. Then we would have been in great trouble. Laughter in Islam is permissible, but with boundaries. And what are these boundaries? One, that you should not lie in order to make people laugh. The Prophet said, والسلام, woe to those who lie so that people would laugh. Woe to them, woe to them. So lying to make people laugh is prohibited. And the Prophet himself والسلام, used to joke with his companions, but he would never ever say something that is haram or a lie. So joking is permissible. He comes to one of his companions in the market and he grabs him from behind and the man cannot see. And he says, who's this? Let me go. And the prophet says, who buys this slave from me? Is he a slave? Yes. He's a slave of? He doesn't lie. The prophet doesn't lie. So he says, who buys this slave from me? When he knew that it was the Prophet ﷺ, instead of fighting him who was holding him, he started going back so that he can get in contact with the body of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how much they loved the Prophet ﷺ. They loved him so dearly that they just wanted to embrace him. And he said, O Prophet of Allah, no one will buy me. Who will buy me? Nobody buys a slave like me. So the Prophet used to joke ﷺ. A woman comes to him, old woman. And she said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, pray for me that I go into Jannah. He said, Old women don't go to Jannah. <gasps> the woman went weeping. He said, Come, 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 come. Old women do not go to Jannah. Allah will turn them back to 33 years of age. So he didn't lie. The Prophet, a man comes to him and said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, give me a camel to go for jihad. 
he will he said i will give you a uh, uh, a son of a she camel i said the prophet what will i do with a son of a she camel a son of a she camel is, is maybe like five six months old he said subhanallah camels are sons of she camels i didn't specify the the age i just told you so the prophet used to joke alayhi but not as we do he used to give little humor with no lying included and also you can joke without making fun of others allah azza wa says in the quran oh you who believe let not a people ridicule another people perhaps they may be better than them nor let women ridicule other women perhaps they may be better than them in a lot of ethnicities countries there is always a country that they make fun of you go to america they make fun of the polish you go to certain parts of arabia they make fun of other arabs you go to maybe india they make fun of the uh, pakistanis pakistanis make fun of the bangladeshis bangladeshis make fun of uh, the saudis everybody make fun of everyone else and this is un-islamic it increases the hatred it increases the arrogance in muslims and this is part of uh, uh, laughter that is not permissible among the rules where you have to observe when laughing that you do not frighten or intimidate a muslim so many times we joke with others by frightening them ending up with a heart attack and he's dead what are you doing children especially and grown-ups they hide in the dark or they stay in a refrigerator until they froze and die <laughs> hoping to scare their mother or to scare their someone their loved one this is haram you come to your friend and with a scorpion or with, with a snake plastic of course not real and you frighten him or you take something that belongs to him all of this is haram in islam the prophet prohibited this sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam and it should be in moderation so spend your day laughing is not acceptable the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam said to abu huraira o oh, abu huraira reduce the amount of laughter because a lot of laughter kills your heart. What does kill your heart mean? Now our hearts are dead or alive. Those who say dead, raise your hands. <laughs> well, why you have a problem? My heart is dead. Seriously. Why? How do I know? If I turn on a soap opera or a comedy show or a, a stand-up comedy, will I laugh? I will laugh my head off. But if I watch atrocities committed against the Muslims and they're being butchered and slaughtered and killed, if I find poverty and uh, famine and drought in a Muslim country, if I see something that breaks your heart, an orphan or someone who's poor, do I cry? No. If I re re listen to the Quran, being recited and the hell and heaven is being described and i am envisioning myself in one of them do i cry no if i watch a movie and the hero is being poisoned and dying and the heroine comes and she says what will i do without you will i cry yes not with the way i said it maybe probably Oscar winning uh, film would be different. Meaning that our hearts are dead. Why are they dead? Because we so indulged in this life. All what we care about is laughing. So laughing is not haram. But so much of it to the extent that it becomes our prime objective. Look at what the Muslims are doing at the moment. How much money is being spent on stand up comedy? on comedy channels on comedy movies billions from the muslims why said we want to have good time we want to laugh okay then this laughter is halal or haram 
it is taking you to haram venues. And this is what kills your heart. Our prime objective on this life is to revive our hearts so that we love for the sake of Allah, we hate for the sake of Allah, we laugh for the sake of Allah, and we weep and cry for the sake of Allah. And I pray to Allah that he gives us a healthy and alive heart. I think we should break here, inshallah.